I'll call to order the House Standing Committee on Appropriations and Revenue. Meeting number eight, Tuesday, March the 8th, 10 a.m., Annex Room 149. All the usual rules apply. If you have a cell phone or other device that emits noise, please put it on silent and or preferably airplane mode so it won't interfere with our equipment. Number two, if you are a member appearing uh, remotely today, make sure, one, that you uh, indicate that on the roll call, and number two, during the meeting, if you seek recognition, uh, please indicate through the chat part of the Zoom. We'll monitor that, try to recognize you as fast as we can or put you in queue. Does any member have any a special guest that they want to recognize? Say no particular person member raise their hands. Uh, all of you are special guests and thank you for being here. So the, you're supposed to clap for yourselves at that point, but that's okay. <clears throat> um, Call the roll, please. Thank you. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bentley. Yes, ma'am. Representative Blanton. Representative Bridges. Here. Representative Dossett. Present. Representative Fisher. Here. Representative Fleming. Present. Representative Flood. Present Annex Office. Thank you. Representative Fugit. Here. Representative Gentry. Here. Representative Hale. Here. Representative Hart. Representative Hatton. Representative McCool. Here. Representative Nemus. Representative Palumbo. Here in my annex office. Thank you. Representative Prenti. Here in the room. Representative Raymond. Here. Representative Riley. Representative Santoro. Representative Tipton. Here in the room. Representative Wilner. Here in the room. Vice Chair Reed. Here in the room. Chair Petrie. President of the room. We have a quorum to conduct business and uh, just update the agenda for today's purposes. House Bills 751 and House Bill 781 will are being turned into discussion only at this point. Chair, would you be so kind as to repeat those two? Thank you. Yes, the last two items on the bills for consideration, House Bill 751 and House Bill 781 are being moved to discussion only. All right, <clears throat> and then we're going to go out of order a little bit. We're gonna take up first House Bill 687, sponsored by Representative Bobby McCool an act relating to a very long description otherwise referred to as the claims bill if each of the two of you will introduce yourselves for the record make sure that you have the microphone sufficiently close to you and that your green lights are on when you're attempting to speak thank you uh by McCool, state representative 9th Seventh district uh ed ross state controller and if each of you will raise your right hands do you swear or affirm to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth i do, do thank you please proceed Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The House Bill uh, 687 is the claims bill, as you mentioned. It's the, the claims bill appropriates funds for payment of claims. And I'm going to interrupt for just a second. I believe we have a committee sub that I'll entertain a motion on. Motion on the committee sub. I have a motion and a second on the committee sub. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The committee sub is adopted. We now have before us House Bill 687 as amended by committee sub one. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, the claims bill appropriates funds for payment of claims against the commonwealth this bill will pay for claims that did not have specific authorization from the current fiscal year and that's it if there's no questions i move for adoption we have a motion on the bill and a second representative wilder thank you mr chairman um thank you for the bill could you just maybe quickly go over with us what the difference is in the committee sub uh yes uh Thank you for the question. Uh, the committee sub is, it just changes uh, 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 currently corrects two names and then adds another claim to it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for bringing this. It seems like this is a little longer than usual. Uh, my question is on page three, section two. Uh, this section uh, is, is basically referring to specific dates. Uh, looks like check numbers and, and dates in the past 
are are the are the have these checks been submitted and could you explain a little bit the, the difference in section two and the claims that are listed in section one okay the uh, section one claims are for let's say services that have been provided to the state let's say goods or services and but the the other section you're referring to is checks that have been issued uh, they are over five years old they were unredeemed they end up in an unredeemed check file so this will bill will reissue those checks and in most cases those checks will or stay in the state treasury and they're being moved from one account in the state system over to another to over in the department of labor black lung or uh, other type of benefit payments any other questions saying none call roll representative beckler yes ma'am representative bentley yes ma'am Representative Blanton. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Fleming. Yes. Representative Flood. Yes. Representative Fugit. Yes. Representative Gentry. Yes. Representative Hale. Yes. Representative Hart. Yes. Representative Hatton. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemus. Yes. Representative Plumbo. Yes. Representative Prunty. Yes. Representative Raymond. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Santoro. Representative Tipton. Yes. Representative Wilner. Yes. Chair Petrie. Yes. 21 yes. Zero no, zero pass. House Bill 687, as amended by Committee Sub 1, having received 21 yes votes, zero no votes, and zero pass votes, will be reported with favorable expression that same should pass on the floor. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you sir. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to announce and be present. Representative Riley, a presence and any votes you need to record? No, thank you. I've got that, okay. I think. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to do as well. Um, present in. Thank you. Anyone else remotely or in person? Thank you. Next up is House Bill 645, Representative Danny Bentley. An act relating to mobile crisis services, making an appropriation therefore and declaring an emergency. If you will, approach the presentation table, introduce yourself for the record. Make sure the microphone is on and sufficiently close. You have been summoned. Dr. Wilner. <laughs> and if each of you will make sure the green lights are on, the microphones are close enough, and introduce yourselves for the record, please. Uh, Lisa Wilner, representative from House District 35. Ken Fleming from uh, House District 48 in Jefferson County. Uh, Danny R. Bentley, District 98 of the Great Commonwealth of Kentucky. Thank you. We each raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. As you can see, I have Representative Fleming and Representative Wilner with me. They were on the Severe Task, uh, task Force for Severe Mental Illness together with me and were great um, contributors to that task force. 
one of the things that came out of the task force was, in Kentucky, we do not have enough providers for mental health. I just talked to a man a minute ago in my office, and he had spent all his fortune just trying to find uh, care for his wife. And, uh, and uh, he, he was telling me he, he makes a really good income. So the stigmatism of, of severe mental health uh, we're trying to go forward. So one of the things we realized was that in rural Kentucky there is not enough providers. So one day I was uh, at a place of a population about 1500 and Pathways had a type A camper which was adjusted to be a mental health clinic. And at that time when I was standing there in front of it, this has been last spring, early last spring, two veterans came up to me with PTSD and said, Dan says, we would never go to a major city for care. But for this, we were privately and we would. So we started looking into that. So we made a recommendation for mobile mental health labs. And, you know, there's so there's the community mental health centers could take one of those and, and reach a lot of people. Let me give you an example. Pathways in Ashland. They, 200 individuals have been hepatitis C HIV tested since they started using theirs. So they can use them for testing also. Approximately a 25% positive rate for hepatitis C. We know hepatitis C is usually needle driven. So um, this is a good place to stop. There is a cure for hepatitis C. When they test positive, this van collaborates with UK, so that's that goes to their center for treatment. 500 individuals, plus the care for mental illness, I'm just telling you the benefit of going out rural with these mobile clinics, 500 in individuals had received Narcan and Narcan training. 2,350 individuals have been engaged in outreach services. Recently, six individuals have been engaged in services and two individuals of color have completed the 28-day residential recovery program. So they are working for the people of Kentucky. So they're, they're getting ready to add a nurse and a therapist to the uh, RV along with a peer support specialist. So now if either Representative Fleming or Wilner would like to make a few comments, welcome. Uh, I'll, I'll just add one thing to this. Uh, well, actually, I'll add two things um, since I've been invited to the table. And one is that uh, uh, the issue of integrated care, that physical health and mental health are interrelated. Um, and so I think this, this bill and this initiative that uh, Dr. Bentley has proposed really brings together that physical health, behavioral health, are interconnected, that you could go to one mobile unit uh, and, and have both sets of needs addressed. So I think that's so important and I think it's really um, quite revolutionary. The other thing I'll say is while we're starting uh, with rural mental health uh, and behavior, excuse me, and physical health um, in, in Dr. Bentley's area in Eastern Kentucky, which is so important that there are underserved areas all over the state in rural areas and in urban areas as well. So I hope that this could be a fantastic pilot project that could expand to other areas across the state. Yes, yeah, so and Mr. Chairman, the only thing I want to add is that uh, I think Dr. Bentley is looking at a holistic approach. Uh, some of y'all know I run a mental health center, and we take a very holistic approach to bring in the physical and the mental, as well as the mental, including the family, in order to address any situations that could, do come up. There is a there is a vacuum without uh, without a doubt in the rural part, and we and through pandemic, uh, at least my as agency, we had to pivot pretty quickly in terms of providing mental health services, uh, very very quickly within two weeks from equipment to training to software, you name it, and part of that I think uh, will help uh, help uh, expand to get into those areas that have a hard time, uh, those individuals have a hard time getting to an area, but this mobile utility provides that uh, that that uh, that access but also tell health can help complement that so it's a win-win I think situation I compliment uh, Dr. Bentley and our representative Bentley and I just want to say one thing on a side note Mr. Chairman um, 
the representative uh, was the, uh, the the co-chair of severe mental health, and we had like about nine or ten uh, recommendations. I think we've already got, but went through about six of them already to through this body and to the to the to the um, to the Senate. So with through his leadership, um, I think we're making a really significant progress in terms of moving the needle when it comes to mental health. I have a motion and a second on the bill, Representative Hale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Bentley and Representative Wilner and Representative Fleming. Uh, my question is, is this basically going to be just targeted to that one area that you are in, or is, this, or is there no. hopes of moving this out in other areas of the state? And Section 2 here, you see the fund is hereby established within the Cabinet to provide loans to all the CMHCs, all 14. And we didn't mention they take these to the homeless shelters too. So instead of trying to get them out, you can go and take care of them and, and reduce some of that stigmatism of mental illness. And we really need that all across the whole state. Yeah. Just one quick. Please. Uh -huh. Just one quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. So, so the intent then is to have these units, uh, and, and I guess you'd answered that, but to have units all across Kentucky that could go into the primarily the rural areas am, am i correct on that? well it can be a primary but it, it, it's up to the cmhc to apply for the funding and if they see a need say you're in an urban area where you have a lot of homelessness mm -hmm. and they want to take it to them they can do that too yeah well thank you i think it's a great idea and i appreciate it very much thank you mm -hmm. mr chair thank you representative beckler thank you mr chairman um the money that is in the bill how many of these uh do you anticipate uh, mobile centers, um, it'll, it'll suffice. Well, normally a type A uh, RV costs around uh, 125000 time they equip it, maybe under 200000 So, you know, if you had a million dollars, it'd be five of them. And so, you know, there's 14 regions. So a lot of the regions I've already talked to, they don't want them or they already have their own. So it's going to work out pretty good, and I think it's going to be one of the best bangs for our buck in the state of Kentucky we've ever seen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Representative Prunty? It's not a question. It's the comment. I served on the Severe Mental Illness Task Force as well, and I just commend you for moving forward with this. I think it's a great idea, and it will help a lot of people. So thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you for the bill. Any other members seeking recognition? We have a motion and a second on the bill. Please call the roll. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bentley. Yes, ma'am. Representative Blanton. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Fleming. Yes. Representative Flood. Yes. Representative Fugit. Yes. Representative Gentry. Yes. Representative Hale. Yes. Representative Hart. Yes. Representative Hatton. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemus. Yes. Representative Plumbo. Yes. Representative Prunty. Yes. Representative Raymond. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Santoro. Yes. Representative Tipton. Yes. Representative Wilner. Yes. Chair Petrie. Yes. 22, 22 yes. Zero nine, zero. House Bill 645, having received 22 yes votes, zero nay votes, and zero pass votes will be reported from this committee with favorable expression that same should pass on the floor. Thank uh, each of you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Honorable Committee. Next up for consideration, we have House Bill 274 by Representative Sal Santoro. And if you will introduce yourself for the record, make sure the microphone is sufficiently close and the green light is on. And if you have a guest, have them introduce themselves also, please. Button. Representative Sal Santoro, Boone District 60. Gary Moore, Boone County Judge Executive. If you'll raise your right hands. 
Do you swear and affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Please proceed. House Bill 274 is uh, – last year I introduced this same bill just for conversation. I'm going to bring about how I came about this bill. As I developed the highway plan for the last several years, a lot of members come up and say, well, we need this, we need that, we would like to have another road. This is just another tool in the toolbox. That's all this is. It's not a, a mandate. This is another way that we can possibly have more infrastructure in our communities. I'm going to let Judge Moore take it from here since I brought him down from beautiful Boone County. All right. Uh, thank you, Chairman Santoro. Uh, to the Chairman and this committee, thank you for the time to discuss this idea. It is another tool in the toolbox, and I'll say a great tool. I'll give you a couple of examples of where we might use it up in northern Kentucky. Uh, we are developing land so quickly, many corridors for road connections that we need for future congestion relief, economic development, and, and other reasons. Those corridors often get cut off with development, whether it be new industrial parks or new subdivisions. Just recently, a couple of fiscal court meetings ago, we had a zone change, and we convinced the developer to set aside part of their new uh, subdivision to 900 homes, uh, mixed use, um, that type of a community, and they're going to set it aside for five years. But they only did that because they understand our, our challenges. If I don't secure the funding for, to buy this corridor from the developer within five years, then they'll go ahead and develop houses on it and will be cut off again. Then we're left to widening existing roads, impacting people's front yards, their mailboxes, uh, the land cost, and the cost to the Commonwealth goes way up because purchasing those already developed parcels to widen an existing road is timely and it's very costly. I can accomplish the same thing through this new corridor with four property owners rather than 57 property owners if I have the funds. So the TID, Transportation Improvement District, would be a great tool where we can blend private developer funds, local, local landowners, county funds, state funds, and eventually federal funds in some cases. It's a way to preserve corridors in this particular case. I'll give you another example. Just yesterday I heard from the CEO of Cincinnati International Airport. We may have the opportunity to partner on an economic development project where we would redevelop some areas of CVG, and we would be able to blend, in this case, land from the airport, federal funds, state funds, and county funds, another place where a tool like this might be important. Uh, those are just a couple of examples. I think it's very insightful by um, Chairman Santoro to consider this. Uh, by the way, we didn't invent this uh, just out of our, uh, yeah. our own genius. Uh, this is an idea we're stealing from Ohio in this case. It's not exactly like the Ohio TID, but it has a lot of the same components. Motion on the bill. I have a motion and a second on the bill. Anything else? Uh, I just want to mention two things. This is not a mandate. There is not, not a mandate at all, and there, this does not have the power of eminent domain. That will only happen through the normal system. Other than that, I'll be quiet. Representative Wilner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this proposal. I think it's very interesting, and I have to say, uh, Representative Santora, when you approached me yesterday, I had never heard of a transportation improvement district. I thought we were talking about TIFFs. Um, so I did some studying last night, or tried to, um, and I, I reached out to some folks who know a lot more about economic policy than I do, and the response I got was, well, this is enormously and we don't know much about it either. Um, so then I was just trying to, you know, Google search it. Um, and so a couple of questions came out of my Google search. And so the first question I came across, um, and I think actually it was in Ohio, that there were a group of developers suing the Transportation Improvement District for, um, for assessments. And so I, I guess, I guess I'm just asking you, you know, what would be the downside? Who would be objecting to this and what are potential, you know, risks? And that, that's my first question. I'm not familiar with the particular case that you're referring to, 
uh, in Ohio with the taxing district that the TID calls, many times there's another layer of taxes that are put on the property within the district, the TID, uh, to pay for it. And I'm guessing, which can be dangerous, that they are uh, uh, concerned about the amount they're being assessed for the cost of the road. Uh, what I would say in, in our particular case is the public hearing process, the process that would go into this, would be in advance of all of that. And if there are concerns about an assessment or additional charges by the landowner or the developer, that would be sorted through at the time the project would be developed. Uh, again, I'm assuming, which can be dangerous. The, um, I don't know, Sal, uh, Chairman Santoro, do you? I'm not familiar with it at all, uh, uh, what happened in Ohio. There are other states, Colorado, Delaware, uh, Virginia. There's several states that already have this TID. Um, it's just another process if they want to use it, if, if uh, your city wants to. I don't know if you read through. We can combine three counties, two counties. There's, it's just many opportunities. Uh, I would like for members come to come into my office and they would now have the opportunity to say, hey, we do have this, that you can have a new road or a development. And it's for every infrastructure, water, sewer, broadband. It's everything. So it's just another tool. It's not a mandate. Please. Uh -huh. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, the other question I have, I, I think that the transportation improvement districts have a board. Um, and so, you know, whenever there's development, there's always potential for lots of money to be made. Um, and so would there be any kind of ethical requirements or ethical um, stipulations for people serving on the board who may have a financial interest in a particular initiative going forward? Is, is there any way to kind of keep that in check? Yeah, the uh, procurement of land would follow the same procurement that we as governments are under today, appraised value. And you would, you would be required to pay, only, only be able to pay what the appraised value of the property is, not overpay. So it's under the same procurement uh, as the current Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, cities, counties follow. So those rules are in place with this bill. They are. And transportation... Uh, they are in favor of this bill. I did, Secretary Gray, he said it's another just great tool for us. Thank you so much. Any other members seeking recognition? Representative Blanton, do you wish to record your attendance at this time? Yes, sir. My apologies. I've been presenting in the Senate committee. Not a, no apology necessary. Do you want to go ahead and record votes on prior bills? Yes. On House Bill 645, I'm an I. House Bill 687, I'm an I. Thank you. I think that should have me called up, sir. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Any other members? Having a motion and a second on House Bill 274. Seeing no other members seeking recognition, please call the roll. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bentley. Yes, ma'am. Representative Blanton. Aye. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Fleming. Aye. Representative Flood. Yes. Representative Fugate. Yes. Representative Gentry. Yes. Representative Hale. Yes. Representative Hart. Yes. Representative Hatton. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemus. Yes. Representative Plumbo. Yes. Representative Prunty. Yes. Representative Raymond. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Santoro. Yes. Representative Tipton. Yes. Representative Wilner. Yes. Chair Petrie. Yes. House Bill 274, having received 23 yes votes, zero nay votes, and zero pass votes, will be reportable with favorable expression that same should pass on the floor. Thank you both very much. Thank you all. And up next, we're going to take up House Bill 684, uh, and then we'll go to House Bill 751 for discussion. 684, I'm going to step down to the table and, rep and uh, 
Chairman Reed will take over. Now we're taking up House Bill 684, Representative Petrie. Please introduce yourself and your guest. Jason Petrie, State Rep from the 16th District. Jenny Bannister, um, LRC Budget Director. Please raise your hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. You may proceed. Thank you. 684 is uh, on the heels of House Bill 1 to address certain uh, budget processes to better enable the General Assembly to um, prepare its information in anticipation of uh, upcoming budgets. A real quick rundown. Uh, there is no committee sub on this bill. Um, Section 1 will remove the requirement that the branch budget uh, when approved, be certified that the budget statements are provided in accordance with KRS 48110. Uh, Section 2 changes the date for state retirement systems to submit a budget requirements from November the 15th to October the 15th. Section 3 changes the date for the agency requests to be submitted by October the 15th rather than November the 15th. Section 4 codifies budget submission format will be developed cooperatively between the budgets, between the branches, so we can all understand the data in a uh, usable format. Section 5 requires OSBD to certify the official revenue estimates by December the 20th of each odd-numbered year rather than by the 10th legislative date of that same odd-numbered year. Section 6 sets deadlines for provision of additional information requested by standing committees. Uh, Section 7 clarifies financial plans should be adopted with modifications made by the General Assembly. 8 requires each cabinet submit information by program rather than budget unit only. Uh, this is program to program within the budget units. And Section 9 grants LRC staff access to electronic accounting and budgeting systems with all branches of government, which is uh, supposed to be in effect already, but doesn't work exactly the way it needs to and functions properly at that point. There is no committee sub, and that is the gravamen of the bill, Mr. Chairman. Second. It's been a proper motion on the bill and a second. Is there any discussion? Yes, uh, Representative Raymond. Thank you. Um, have you heard from stakeholders? Have they said it, it will be difficult for them to move reporting back a month? I've, I've heard nothing uh, from stakeholders regarding movement of the dates. Um, most of the dates, and I'm trying to think if there's an exception to this statement, are from about a month earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not moving them back a whole lot, just enough to give us an extra 30 days and for staff to be able to process the information uh, more effectively and more reasonably in a time frame. And a follow-up, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, section 4, I feel like there's probably a funny story uh, about why you're asking for the data to come in, in in a certain format. Would you explain to us why that's necessary? Uh, no funny story, but um, uh, between the branches, uh, we consistently have this problem uh, with the judicial branch, with the executive branch, and even between branch, between units within the branches, it seems like. Um, software systems and ours don't speak the same language. Uh, the data comes in a different format, and so if you um, receive a large compilation of data, but you have no way to process it automatically, uh, it's basically a data dump that does you no good. Uh, you can't effectively digest it and analyze it. So this is trying to say, look, we all have to recognize we have different systems. Let's make sure that when the data comes across, we can all use it. That's all it is. Okay, seeing no further discussion, clerk, please call the roll. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Representative Bentley. Yes, ma'am. Representative Blanton. Aye. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Fleming. Yes. Representative Flood. 
Representative Flood. Representative Fugate. Yes. Representative Gentry. Yes. Representative Hale. Yes. Representative Hart. Yes. Representative Hatton. <coughs> Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemus. Yes. Representative Palumbo. Yes. Representative Prunty. Yes. Representative Raymond. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Santoro. Yes. Representative Tipton. Yes. Representative Wilner. Yes. Chair Petrie. Yes. Yeah, 22. With 22 yay votes, zero no votes, zero passes, House Bill 684 passes with favorable expression, same shit on the House floor. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee. At this time, call up to the table, Representative Miles. And this is for discussion only. Just introduce yourself for the record and your guests. You may proceed. State representatives. We've got all our microphones. State representative Suzanne Miles of the seventh district, and I have um, four four presenters today. So I don't know. Do you want to swear in everyone at the same time, or what would you like to do with that? I believe this is for discussion only, so you may proceed. Okay. Right. Very well. Um, we've we've got multiple guests with us today. So first, I want to thank the Chairman Petrie and, and Chairman Reed for having us here today and also our guests that have come from home. We always enjoy having people from home and, and especially whenever they can tell their story. Today I have with me um, multiple people but we'll start off with our first one. This is Steve Knopfsinger. He is a respiratory therapist with Onesboro Health and I'm going to let him tell a little bit of the story of why we're here today. Uh, thanks for having me here everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Knopfsinger. I'm a respiratory therapist at Owensboro Health in Owensboro. Um, I have worked exclusively on the COVID wing for the past two years, uh, volunteered for it. Uh, I remember the very first patient that came into Owensboro Health uh, with COVID. Uh, it was in March, I believe, of 2020. Just, just one moment. Representative Miles, if you can scoot his microphone up just a little bit, we're having some members trouble hearing. Thank you, sir. Sorry. I believe it was in March of 2020. Uh, I remember getting the call. There's a COVID patient here. Uh, we're going to intubate this patient. Uh, you need to go down and help out. Uh, so I remember walking down the hallway and uh, hearing nothing on the way down. Didn't hear anybody talking. Didn't see anything to my side. Anything. Just kind of, you know, sheer terror, basically, because we didn't know what COVID was. We knew that it was it was very serious. Um, so that happened time and time again. It happened for two years uh, up until this point today. Uh, through that time, uh, staff began to to leave for various reasons, burnout, what have you. Uh, they even went into manufacturing. They went completely out of health care. Uh, uh, I don't know why, I guess it was burnout, scared of COVID, what have you. Uh, we began to get short-staffed, we began to wear on the staff. Um, we started to pick up pace even more. We had to pick up the pace of what we did every day. Uh, I remember one time, very first patient in the morning, uh, I was in a super big hurry. Uh, remember going into the room. You know, I only knew the patient by the room number. I didn't look at the name on the list. Went into the room. I was gowned up. Went everything. I said, hey, my name is Steve. I'm uh, from respiratory. I'm going to uh, give you a breathing treatment, what have you. I turned around. I looked at the patient. It was somebody I knew for 30 years. I was in that big of a hurry that I didn't even take the time to look at the name on the list. 
uh, pretty shocking, actually, that uh, we're in that big of a hurry. We're that short staffed that I didn't even didn't even see that. So uh, that happened. And then, you know, you kind of take stock of yourself, how you do things, kind of slow it down a little. Uh, you know, there were other instances where we were so short staffed. I remember going to the floor one day, one morning, and I walked up to the floor, hadn't even started my workload yet. And four nurses came up to me before I even started with my first patient saying, hey, we need you to do this, 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 and this before I even started. Uh, so each of those patients needed care immediately on the COVID floor, but I had to prioritize those patients. So it would have helped if we'd had more, more therapists at that particular time also. But, uh, I mean, it wore on all of us. It wore on our nerves, uh, you know, broke down once and, uh, just out of the blue, never done that before. And, uh, but got through it. And two years later, here we are. I think we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. You know, thank God. But uh, I just don't want anybody to forget, you know, what we've been through here. Uh, it's been a real, real battle uh, for us. Uh, you know, I've always pushed people, I'm not pushed, but I've encouraged them to get vaccinated. And I think it's cost me some friendships. But uh, we've been through what I call the health crisis of our lifetime. Uh, worldwide, there's been over 6 million people die from this disease. If you're not going to get vac vaccinated now, I don't think you're ever going to get vaccinated. So thanks for your time. Next, we're going to invite um, the president and CEO from Owensboro Health to join us along with, we've got Dr. Scott Williams from OCTC that are going to kind of tell exactly 751 what this bill is and what the solution that they brought to me to present to the committee so that um, hopefully we can not only plan for this situation, but the situation that was already happening prior to COVID, which was the loss of, of workforce and health care. So I'll invite. Uh, and sir, as you leave the table, thank you for your story. We appreciate it. Thank you. He's not going far. So <laughs> if you all have additional questions for him, It'll be uh, that will be fine. So I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Williams and uh, Mark Marsh so that they can can share what their suggestion was that this is something that they brought to me i know that members often appreciate the things people bring solutions to you and this is what they brought with me so here we are you may proceed thank you representative miles <clears throat> thank you mr chairman so um as you heard firsthand the from somebody that's on the front lines the wor healthcare workforce shortage is significant and severe um, across the Commonwealth and actually nationwide. Uh, and so uh, in our area, the western region of the state, a coalition of uh, major health care providers and eight colleges and universities uh, began meeting and discussing how can we uh, impact or reduce this shortage? What can we do to, uh, to overcome uh, the burden? And so out of that resulted in a solution that we think is innovative, creative, and uh, comprehensive that we call the Commonwealth West Healthcare Workforce Innovation Center. This is a collaborative solution that can actually address all potential students, especially those in rural areas. Uh, that includes both uh, those students that are what we would call non-traditional students, your traditional post-secondary students, as well as high school students. And the center will help to really compensate or, or create a environment where we can address three of the major issues that are really impacting the ability to produce more healthcare workers. 
And the first one is access. And what the center will do is provide the resources that will allow us greater access to those types of students, especially in rural areas across the region that will uh, be both adult students, as I said, as well as uh, dual credit or high school students and a traditional post-secondary student. And the access will be available through the center in the form of either a site itself and it will also create ability through advanced technologies to deliver a lot of this training remotely so that we can deliver it out to especially rural areas. An example of this would be, for instance, we at this point in time, in order to get people to be interested to enter the healthcare uh, healthcare industry, uh, we will need to really increase the enthusiasm uh, the, uh, for individuals to say, you know, a healthcare career is great. This is where you need to be. It's a high wage, high demand field, uh, and that it's needed across the Commonwealth. And so the center will provide the resources that we can go out and push this to all the region. Uh, whether that be in non-traditional areas or in high schools to uh, really increase that enthusiasm for people to come into that health care field. It will also uh, really define the pathways in which a student can go through beginning as early as high school all the way through to a master's degree or even a doctoral level degree that will give those students that availability. In addition to access, we can accelerate through this center, through the resources in which we could be able to really, through a dual credit six uh, uh, delivery system, deliver those math and sciences that a lot of our rural high schools can't deliver. Uh, and so they just don't have the, the, the faculty to do that. We could deliver that, get those students, those prerequisites out of the way so when they graduate from high school, they can accelerate into a career, healthcare career platform. The other piece of the puzzle that will, uh, center will allow us to address is really in order to increase capacity, we need two things. Number one is we need more faculty. And so this collaborative, which includes all of the healthcare sector industries, uh, and that's everything from home health to uh, that could be uh, long-term care to healthcare systems to medical offices, will allow us access to those uh, 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 trained or a credentialed uh, faculty that could help us expand, uh, give us the faculty that we need on the health, on the educational side in order to train uh, more students. So if we attract more students, we're going to need more faculty to train those students. And finally, um, the capacity is that uh, as we move forward, increase the number of students, the center will give us the facilities both remotely and on site to allow more high fidelity simulation. Uh, even though all schools will have some form of simulation, the ability to add some advanced high fidelity simulation will really be a true benefit for those students in their training because quite frankly, as you enter the clinical sector and the clinical training, students, uh, it, you could overrun a healthcare facility pretty quickly. So uh, more simulation training will be required. And then finally, collaboration. This gives us the opportunity, the, and, and I've been in this 35 years, this gives us the best opportunity in which we are seeing both the healthcare industry as well as the higher education community work collaboratively together to address a very severe need. And in the end, what we will see, and I feel very strongly, is that this gives us the opportunity to collaborate to produce a Kentucky Fame model for healthcare workers that will give students the ability to work and earn and learn which reduces their barriers to move forward and be successful. So in essence, uh, we feel like this solution is one that is certainly worthy of evaluation. And so Representative Miles, I'll turn it over to our CEO, Mark Marsh. And one of the most important things, you do, you do have a packet um, in your folder to give more information as far as more of the specifics, but one of the most important things to me that I was excited about, it was a collaborative effort of multiple higher education in our area that have come to, to the table and worked toward this. In addition, since this has come out and been filed, we've had an additional school reach out and ask to be included in that, which is wonderful. Um, we do have Dr. Um, Zarapata with us today from KCTCS, and that's kind of the avenue that this funding would go through, would be through the Winsboro Community College is the avenue. So I'll turn it over to Mark Marsh and let him tell their side of the story. Thank you, Representative Miles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I'll try not to be redundant here. Representative Miles, make sure his microphone. Oh, Oops, there you go. Thank you. Go. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Miles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll try not to be redundant here with uh, Dr. Williams. Um, I serve, have the opportunity, the pleasure of serving along um, nine colleagues in a <clears throat> collaborative with all the uh, CEOs and presidents with the major health systems throughout the state. So every month we get a chance to talk and uh, um, compare notes and what, what we're working on. <clears throat> I will say 90% of those conversations, certainly over the last six months, I've uh, been back in, in Owensboro for eight months, um, have really revolved around workforce solutions. I had the pleasure, I spent last week, I went up to the University of Kentucky, spent the day with Dr. Mark Newman, <clears throat> walked around the great campus, great facility, seeing the amazing work that they're doing. And I, I can say that pretty holds true with most of the other great systems we have throughout the state, but we talked a lot about workforce. We talked a lot about what you heard from Steve and from Dr. Williams today. And so what we're presenting today, I believe truly is a comprehensive approach it's something that's going to bring all the local great university colleges we have in all of Western Kentucky. It's going to allow us to connect in to many of these high schools. Um, during our conversation with many of these high school superintendents, we find out the more rural we get, the less opportunities and more importantly, the less ability we have to teach the anatomy and physiology, the math, the sciences. Sometimes we don't have the, the math teachers to teach the curriculum. So if we can create the, the connectivity between these great universities with these high schools, how many kids are slipping through the cracks? How do we create the excitement, the joy again about this healthcare career? What you're going to hear from Steve and what you're going to hear from Ray, that people have served for 30 years, their love, their passion. They got into healthcare to serve people. And we want to recreate that. We want to rejuvenate that. I've had the pleasure of doing town hall meetings most recently. We've got 5,000 team members, I believe, are the largest employer west of Louisville. But recently, Friday, and for those town hall meetings, by comparing and sharing some things where we are, where we've been, where we're going, I think we instilled some sense of hope that now we can find team members who can work alongside these folks. Because you've heard mental health on a couple different occasions here today, the mental health toll it's had on our team members, on our providers, it's very taxing. And so I think this really approach, this innovation center will allow us to help facilitate that, to recharge, to be tentacles within these high schools. So these kids and young adults find pathways I don't want to make it about money, but certainly th these are jobs. These are needed. We're going to lose 3.2 million healthcare workers shy by the year 2026. A million nurses are anticipated to leave the profession in two years. But if we can get out there and re reinvigorate and, and restore that confidence of this great care, um, not to mention the compensation. We've spent so much money. Each of these, these other health systems are spending millions of dollars every month on travelers. Great. We've needed them. But we're talking excess of $10 million in some months. It's not sustainable. So not to mention, we want the collegiality. We want those coworkers to be working with each other every day who know each other. It helps with quality outcomes, just the continuity. So I think this project really does encompass allowing us to work with these great nine, 10 universities, all the high schools throughout. This is a regional approach. It's going to help every healthcare system there is. It's just not an Owensboro Health Project. It's going to help every health system there is. Long-term care. Folks who are working without those CNAs, the certified nursing assistants, who can't care for our loved ones. We're aging. We have more geriatrics who are going to need health care. So, again, I think this really is something that really complements the other things that we're working on. But I think this will allow us the chance to accelerate what we can do and really meet the needs throughout all of Western Kentucky. So thank you for hearing our story. I'm very passionate about this, but I believe it truly will make a difference and truly is a solution to some of our issues. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Ray Foreman. She is a nursing supervisor with Onesboro Health. She also is a former student of Dr. Scott Williams. So you know this is a proud moment for him today <laughs> to have one of his students come before you today. So um, we're going to let Ray tell her story a little bit. I want to thank all y'all for allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to elaborate from the nursing standpoint, similar to Steve. Uh, COVID came and it rocked us to our core. All of a sudden, we were seeing deaths, answering questions we didn't have the answers to. We've seen some things. It affected my family away from home deeply. Um, I've been up there almost two years on CCU. 
um, within two months of me being there, I volunteered. And I stayed back there in COVID for six months and I did not come out. My coworkers drug me out because I didn't even see the effect it was having on me. <sighs> Through the months I've witnessed several of my coworkers leave. I've seen them on numerous medications for depression and anxiety. I've seen them not even want to come to work anymore. I've seen them leave and go to totally even different fields similar to see we're tired, our morale is low and we need, we need a breath, we need some rejuvenation. And I really have faith in this bill. I really do. Um, even through everything we've been through, I do it again. And I'm gonna speak for my hospital and my family at work and say they would too. It's our duty. Are we tired? Yeah. But we're going to keep fighting. But we need more help. We need more help. We need some more fighters of all ages, all backgrounds. We need it. And I think it'll be great for the community to see that variety and that background. Who better? so much diversity, more relatable, and I think that'll make a even more better difference if we take this approach. I really do. I really do. As you can see, we've got some wonderful people here with us today um, presenting, but this is the reason that when people bring things to you, raise one of the reasons we need this solution. So at this point, I'll open it up for questions for any of our presenters. Representative Nemus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to say thank you to, for bringing this to all of you. Um, I, I've worked with nurses and doctors throughout the Commonwealth of Kentucky in my professional life. I've worked with a number of uh, nurses and doctors and, and administrators in Owensboro Health. And Owens, it's just different. I don't know what it is, but Owensboro Health is just different. The nurses and the physicians have a uncommon dedication to their um to their patients and I, I don't there's no question in there but i wanted to just say to ray and to everyone else thank you guys um like i said i work with hospitals all across the state and there's none better than owens mm -hmm. so whatever you're doing we need to replicate we need to transfer to other areas of the commonwealth so ray thank you and, and, and i want to directly thank you in particular you. Uh, for what you've done um you guys were the front lines in the last two years and and took care of our people and so, I do it again. Right. That's awesome. So anyway, thank you. And let's, whatever you got in your water, let's ship it out to everywhere else. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do right now. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Representative Wilner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for this bill. And thank you for the amazing people you brought to testify with you, Representative Miles. Um, thank you, Ms. Foreman. And... Mr. Nofsinger, uh, for being on the front lines of, of this crisis and this, this pandemic. Um, I, I, this is my favorite kind of legislation. It's the kind of legislation that addresses a real and urgent problem and that the solution is coming from the folks closest to the problem and it's collaborative, different sectors working together. Um, and I, I just want to thank you and all of you who sat at the table on this measure. And I'll just say that my only disappointment is that we're not voting on it today and approving it and sending it to the floor. And I hope we'll have the opportunity to do that very soon. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Tipton. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Miles, I appreciate you bringing this to, to us today. To Ray and Steve, I just want to say thank you for your dedication, commitment to your patients, to uh, the people in your community. That, that's who you've been there to serve, and thank you so much. Uh, I think this is a great proposal. Uh, this is various, along the lines of many conversations that I've had with Preston Thompson at CPE about expanding pathways. 
Uh, I represent Spencer County. They have a great health care mm-hmm. pathway program mm-hmm. in that school. And, and, and the way you've gone about this approach of recognizing what the deficiencies are, uh, especially with uh, having qualified staff, things like that. And, and I, I hope this is something that we can get through and maybe that we can model okay. across the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know House Bill 1 included some funds to go mm-hmm. to CPE for mm-hmm. a health care mm-hmm. initiative. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully, maybe they'll look at this model mm-hmm. and, as, as they look to how to uh, distribute those funds. But thank you for being <coughs> here today and look forward to continuing to work with us on this significant issue and concern that we have across the state. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Raymond. Thank you. Uh, like Representative Tipton, I think, I think we need four or five or six of these. Uh, so I wanted to ask if if we might be starting in Western Kentucky because you all have unique needs or unique infrastructure that's already in place. Um, I know in a few years when it's up and running and, and uh, hugely successful, you're not going to like it when your nurses move to Louisville. Mm-hmm. So um, what do you think are the opportunities to make this a model? Well, it's not unheard of in the past for the state to invest in one-time money to start something. Northern Kentucky is a perfect example of that, and NKU was was one of those recipients um, in the past. So just to give you all an idea, it's not um, brand new as far as the investment side of it from the state. As far as the model, by them coming to me and have already you know, they've already combined their efforts as far as that with the public and with the higher eds to come up with a solution. This would most definitely, um, with its success, could be a model for anywhere across our state. Um, I know Representative Bentley had already said, what about East Kentucky? Well, I'm more than happy for East Kentucky educators to get together and come with us with the proposal from the same direction. Um, additionally, it's been wonderful to have a partner with Owensboro Health, but I also don't want to leave out, we have multiple other partners that are involved with this. They are one of the main, obviously, one of the main um, contributors to this and investments. This is one-time money investment. Once this is, once that it is set up, my expectation is for the higher education and the local community and the region for that matter to be the sustainability of this going forward with the success of that. So um, this is also in addition to the long-term care facilities, the um, Wendell Foster Center locally is one of the partners, River Valley Behavioral Health. We've got multiple partners that have already invested in their commitment to say that they want to help and participate because they're all looking for workforce and they want to see the results of that, of their investments locally. But every single one of these students could be trained to move anywhere in the Commonwealth or outside of the Commonwealth for that matter. Obviously, we want to keep them here, but um, the intent would be that for this model to be successful, this could be a model that could be used in healthcare across our state, and it could also be a, used a model for other items the way that the Kentucky, the FAME program was referenced. Um, they've used that model in our area quite often. And that would also be a model that could be used for other industries. And I might add, Representative Raymond, I think what made it unique in our area is just the collaboration. The healthcare providers and the higher education institutions came together and really, you know, we had long discussions as what's preventing us from addressing this efficiently and effectively. And so After looking at those, uh, everybody agreed, hey, we need to work together uh, so that we can, uh, because this solution impacts all of us. Everybody needs health care, high quality health care. And so I think uh, as a result of that, I would say in one word is that everybody was collaborative and decided. And I think that's what has made this move forward in a very successful manner in the Western region. And to answer your question, as Representative Miles said, uh, it can be duplicated. In fact, this is a similar concept they're looking at in East Tennessee. Uh, the difference is it's only one institution and one hospital. So this is over multiple partners, which I think makes it even more efficient and effective. Representative Palumbo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to thank the presenters for what you have done for Owensboro Healthcare and to Representative Miles for your vision in bringing this to us. I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative.
Chairman Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the bill. Um, the collaboration, this started last year, so it's not something that popped up just during session, which is usually more difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell uh, the work that's been put into it over an extended period of time, the collaboration of it. Uh, it's not just lasered on nurses, just respiratory. It's holistic. Right. Uh, so we need more nurses. We need more respiratory therapists. However, we also need everyone else in the support <laughs> system to make sure you can focus on what you need to focus on and are best trained for, and the same thing for respiratory. Signed off as a primary co-sponsor. I like it. Don't do that unless I like something, okay? But I do want to take a moment, critical care and others, nurses, respiratory therapists, which aren't talked about as much as critical care nurses. Um, I'm going to take just a moment to say thank you. My wife's a critical care nurse and has been for over a quarter of a century at this point, and um, she volunteered, like you, to work COVID-only units. Uh, I understand the full risks and how that works. And I don't know if people understand the, the difference. Nurses and respiratory therapists, what are y'all used to doing? You're used to coming in and knowing someone and learning their family and then taking care of them and then sending them out the door better off than they came in. COVID turned that around the other direction. Yes, it did. And day after day, week after week, month after month, you wouldn't see those people leave. Yeah, and that's, that's a heart wrenching. So thank you for that. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that we change this to a vote rather than discussion only. I don't know of anyone who has signed up opposed to the bill. I'd ask that we put that on for a vote with your permission. Is there a second? Second. There's no one signed up in opposition. The motion has been made by Representative Petrie and second that we move this from discussion only to a vote. At this time, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? At this time, the chair will entertain a motion for House Bill 751. So moved. It has been properly moved and seconded for, to move forward with House Bill 751. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we should now proceed to vote. Clerk, please call the roll. Representative Beckler. Yes, ma'am. Representative Bentley. May I explain my vote, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'm voting yes, but I sure would like to see all the paperwork being in one folder for Eastern Kentucky. Because let me tell you, I talked to a nurse practitioner the other day. She went to hang an insulin bag, and there was already an insulin bag hanging. She went to pull tubes out, and they were gone before she got there. The reason? Travel nurses. Couldn't speak English. Couldn't follow up on the orders. We need to produce our own. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Blanton. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Dossett. Yes. Representative Fisher. Yes. Representative Fleming. Aye. Representative Flood. Representative Fugit. Representative Gentry. Explain my vote, please. Yes, sir. I'd like to cast a yes vote for Owensboro Health employee Clara Hook, who lobbied this to me <laughs> last night. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Representative Hale. May I explain the vote, please? Yes, sir. I want to vote yes proudly and say that I was one of those people, not in your facility, but I was one of those people that was desperately ill with COVID and appreciate what those nurses did for me and got me back on health, on the road to health. And I, I proudly vote yes because of that. But thank you so much for what you've done and what you do and for all of those across the state. I proudly vote yes, Mr. Chair. Representative Hart. Representative Hatton. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Nemus. Yes. Representative Palumbo. May I please explain my yes vote? Yes, ma'am. I have a very special place in my heart for Owensboro Healthcare and appreciate what you're doing. And Representative Miles, thank you for bringing this to the table. Representative Prunty. 
Res resounding yes. Representative Raymond. Yes. Representative Reed. Yes. Representative Riley. Yes. Representative Santoro. Yes. Representative Tipton. Yes. Representative Wilner. Would you like to explain my yes vote? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you again. I'm so happy that we were able to vote on this today. That's great news. And I um, just want to mention the, the mental health aspect uh, for the patients, mm -hmm. for the providers, mm -hmm. uh, and how critically important that is. And to thank you for including clinical psychology and behavioral health in your of, uh, profession. So thank you for that. And, and resoundingly, yes. Chair Petrie. Yes. With 18 yes votes, no, no votes, zero pass votes, House Bill 751 passes favorably. Same shit on the House floor. What started as discussion is now moving on to the House floor. Congratulations, Representative Miles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman, Chairman Reed. And let's thank all the Rays and the Steves out there that have taken good care of us. Wait, wait. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'd like to record a yes vote on House Bill 751. Yes, sir. Yeah. 751 or 687, Mr. Representative Santoro? Well, two on 751 and one more on 687. Okay. Sorry. There you go. Rep Representative Palumbo, you wish to communicate with the committee? Uh, yes, sir, please. Yes, sir, I would like to change my yes vote on House Bill 684 to no. You have been recorded. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any further business before this committee? Representative Gentry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would also like to change my vote on House Bill 684 from a yes to a no with regards to um, language that was removed in Section 7. Yes, sir. Thank any, you. Any further business? This hearing is adjourned.